Good morning, church. Good morning. Well, this morning is really a busy Sunday morning. Eh? But now we reach the highlight for our worship this Sunday. And that is to open up our hearts and spirit to receive the teaching from the Lord. I'm very privileged to able to share this uh, our continued study of the book of Acts. And uh, before I start, let's go to the Lord to ask Him to bless our time here together. Our Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace to worship you. Bless our time here as you open our eyes to behold the wondrous things out of your word. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For those words which are not from you, scatter them as shaft to the winds. But deposit your Rima words into our heart and our innermost being, so that we are not mere hearer of your word, but be doer of your word. Enable us to walk closer with you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, we have uh, finished, uh, concluded uh, Acts chapter 2. Uh, covered by our elder Jun Lai and our brother Sean. Do you recall what is the main event in Acts 2? Anyone? Yes, the day of Pentecost. With the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the disciples were given the gift of being able to speak in other languages. The message of the Pentecost was about the mighty works of God, okay, through our Lord Jesus. And Peter was able to deliver a sermon explaining to the crowd that gathered in amazement, right, of the miraculous happening. As a result, 3,000 souls were saved when Peter called for their repentance. And thus, the New Testament church is born. Well, this morning I will move on to Acts chapter 2. We shall cover the whole chapter, all 26 verses. Uh, chapter 3, sorry. <laughs> okay, we are not cover all the uh, 26 verses, but we shall read, we are not read through the whole chapter, but we are cover the first 10 verses. Let's stand and read the Verses together. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms for those who enter the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes, they said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word. Uh, please be seated. Uh, if you have the Bible, will you keep it open to uh, chapter 3 as we uh, make frequent uh, references to it? Now, the early church came on fire on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. By the time we come to Acts chapter 3, it was three months later. And the thousands of pilgrims who came to Jerusalem for the festival had gone home. 
the city almost returned to normal, but not quite. This could never be the same again in Jerusalem because by now, there's a group of people filled with the Holy Spirit and with the, comp and the passionate love for Christ, for Jesus. Wherever you find a strong, local, spirit-filled church, the city could never be the same. It will not be business as usual because the fire of God must prevail and spread. We as CMC aspire to be the spirit-filled church, to be the cutting-edge church, as we carry the spirit of faith and revival into Singapore. We are exerting our authority in the spiritual realm. We are here to dominate the spiritual landscape. We are here to take over in the name of Jesus. The devil, know, the devil knows this. This is what happened to the early church. Acts chapter 3 comprises of a miraculous event of a lame man, born crippled from birth, being healed in Jesus' name. And the explanation given by Peter's subsequent sermon to the Jew in the temple. Now, let's visualize. On the day, Peter and John were walking on the dusty road towards the temple for the prayer. It was around 3 p.m. in the afternoon. They would have to pass through the entrance to the temple in the court, the entrance called Beautiful Gate. Historians tell us that that was the Eastern Gate. And the gate was made of Corinthian brass overlaid with silver and gold. Now, the sun would rise up behind the eastern mountains. And you can imagine that the, the whole place would be dazzling and brilliant, reflecting the sunlight. Yet, under such a beautiful surrounding, at the base, of the gate were throngs of broken and miserable people begging for arms, people who were trying to get by for the day. Both Peter and John must have made the same journey through it many times, and they must have passed through this crowd of beggars asking for arms. They may even give occasional coins to some of them. But on this day, recorded in Acts chapter 3, it's not, it is not like any other day. Let's examine in greater detail what happened that day. We can draw out some key points about how the city of Jerusalem was shaken. First, we must move in God's timing and not our own. Now, let's return back to the scene where Peter and John were walking through the crowd of beggars at the beautiful gate. Peter and John might have seen many of them before, right? Yet, on that particular day, it was God's specific time for this particular beggar, right, to be chosen. Out of the many wretched faces and outstretched hands begging for arms, Peter and John only looked straight at this one particular lame man. I tru truly believe that both Peter and John was, were directed to this particular lame man by the Holy Spirit. Perhaps they heard the voice of the Lord telling them, I'm about to work a miracle in this lame man's life. This is what I will call the Kairos moment. Now, Kairos is one of the two uh, ancient Greek concepts of time. Right? The other word is uh, koronos, which refers to the measure, ticking, quantity, time we are familiar with 
but on our wristwatch, uh, which tell us time and so on. But Kairos is God's time. Kairos moments are moments of destiny, of divine appointment. Now, Kairos time is an extraordinary time when God interrupts our routine and touches us so deeply that we are changed forever. As an individual, as part of CMC, we need to be sensitive to such Kairos moments. We need to have the stillness of heart and sensitivity of spirit to be receptive to God's direction and God's leading. Well, we can try to do things on our own, and I think this happened more than we like to admit. However, if it's not God's timing, nothing seems to move. But if it's God's timing, everything will flow. This is so because it's God moving, not our own striving. In John 5, 19, Jesus said, The Son can do nothing for Himself, but what He sees the Father do. For whatever He does, the Son does also in like manner. So, Jesus' miraculous works are done according to the Father's timing. Paul too said in Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. On that particular day, Peter felt the overwhelming compassion and the desire to see this lame man healed. As you can see, he was so sure of God's timing that he didn't even pray for the lame man. What did he do? Instead, he just commanded him to walk in Jesus' name. This is great confidence of what can be only happen if we hear the if we are hearing the voice of God. Many times we are we too can discern the timing of God through our sudden search of faith and this overwhelming feeling of compassion. I recall once I was ministering to a, a, gent, uh, a man who came for physical uh, healing. He claimed to be a believer, a regular churchgoer, but though not baptized yet. But somehow I felt in the spirit that there is something seriously lacking in his spiritual life. He needs a spiritual renewal more than a physical healing. After much probing, I led him to say the sinner's prayer. And for once, he finally realized the true meaning of salvation, of his need for Jesus as his Savior, and the need to be born again in Christ. Now, Salvation itself is a miracle. For those of you who have led others to salvation, you can testify that it's the work of the Holy Spirit, not our own persuasive power, not our enlightening discourse of the Scripture. It's a kairos time for the person to become part of the body of Christ. While I'm standing here behind the pulpit sharing God's word and proclaiming the revival will come upon CMC, upon, upon each and every one of us. It's not a confidence based on what we can do because we cannot do much. But it's a confidence based on the fact that we have God's promise and God's given strategy that as long as we are obedient and faithful, building on His blueprint, 
and not dependent on our own efforts, our own strength, our own human planning, we will have the victory in the end. We must trust God to give us what we need, not what we want. Take note. The beggar got more than what he asked for. He asked for arms and God gave him his legs instead. We need to realize that God's provision is often so much better than our demand. God will never give us whatever we ask for. But He gave us what we really need. So often we ask for short-term relief instead of long-term solution. We ask for promotion in our job. We ask for scoring A's in exams. We ask for closing the deal. We ask for marrying the ideal man or woman. Many times we have yearned for that particular job, that particular position, only to be turned down. Yes, sometimes we get what we ask for, but what we get is ultimately in line with God's longer-term plan for us. Let me use the analogy of the chess game. Life is like a chess game. Between God, the grandmaster of chess, and me, a novice in chess, a beginner. I move the chess pieces around the board. Some are good moves, but most often, they're really poor choices. But God, the chess master, respond with great wisdom, great expertise to all my moves. He has not pre-programmed his move. He responds to the move that I make. And without realizing it, the chess master weaves all my moves into his grand game plan. Brothers and sisters, if we want CMC to be a cutting edge church, to a, be a sick, to be a city shaking, shaking church, we have to believe that our God is a miracle working God who knows what is best for us. We need to be sensitive enough to realize that when He closes the doors, we should not try to pry them open. But when he opens the door, we must be courageous enough to enter in. Next, we must depend on God's power and not our own. To shake this little red dot of Singapore, we must depend on God's power and not on our own human strength. The apostles of the early, early church have no human resources. What they have are divine resources. This brings me to the story of this uh, Thomas Aquinas, the 13th century Dominican monk who visited Innocent III, who was then counting the offerings which came in in the morning service. When the Pope saw Aquinas staring at the huge pile of money on the table, he turned and said, Ah, Thomas, my son, gone are the days when the church needs to say, Silver and gold, have I none? Thomas Aquinas replied sadly, Gone also are the days where we say, Rise up and walk in Jesus' name. The day when we trust our own wealth, our own strength, our own resources 
is the day when we will lose the power of God. Perhaps as CMC merchant, as we are celebrating our 28th anniversary, owning our own property, becoming self-sufficient financially, we have to be more careful, more vigilant. When we have great resources, the tendency is to depend less on the divine resources. And thus, we become less God-conscious. It was A.W. Tozer, a great uh, American pastor, author, and spiritual mentor, who observed that if God had taken the Holy Spirit out of the, Holy, out of the early church, 95%, 95% of the activities would have stopped. And everybody would have noticed a difference. But if God takes the Holy Spirit out of the church today, 95% of our activities will go on as usual. And nobody would know the difference. Let's be aware of that. It's a good reminder. We must learn to trust our Lord more simply because we need Him more. We must have time for the individual, not just the multitude. Peter and John have shown us that there, the way to transform the city is by helping an individ, individual sin, sinner. What Peter and John had done to the beggar and his transformed life led to conversion of 5,000 others as recorded in Acts chapter 4, verse 4. As times go on, as CMC develops better and better programs and activities, we must always remember that it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can win over Singapore. What on our part we have to do is do it one person at a time. There's no shortcut. We must commit ourselves that we will always have time for the individual. There was this story about this pastor of a very successful church. We have grown bigger and bigger, and his, therefore his, the pastor daily schedule became busier and busier. One day, a lady member wanted to see the pastor, but he told his secretary that, oh, I'm so busy, I have no time, time to meet up with this uh, lady member. The secretary replied, that is amazing. Even God has not reached that stage yet. <laughs> we sometimes find ourselves busy doing things. We cannot find time to join the cell group meeting, join the prayer meeting, or even go to church on Sunday. This busyness could be a result of having our priorities all wrong. Remember, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. It's always a good reminder, especially for the uh, CMC ministry leaders, that no matter how busy, how busy we have become, let us not forget to make time for the individual. As individual lives are being transformed, they become the best testimonial of God's power. The best defense of the Christian faith is a changed life, particularly if the change is dramatic. We can look to the case of uh, Lazarus, who was brought back to life by Jesus. We can see in uh, John chapter 12, verses 9 to 11, that, Jesus, uh, that Lazarus 
attracted as much attention as Jesus. Let us not be afraid of the difficult cases, the Lazarus, the traumatic conversion of life, because those could be the key which unlock the community to the transforming power of God. To be a city-shaking church, we must be able to give the people the personal touch, the personal attention, especially those Lazarus in our midst. Finally, we must live up the name of Jesus alone. Peter said to the beggar in verse uh, 6, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Just two months ago, the whole of Jerusalem was ringing with the name of Jesus. Everybody knew that he was crucified. Therefore, using the name of Jesus implies he is still alive. That is why there is power in the name of Jesus. No wonder such a big crowd of curious people were gathered. They must be asking, what power is this? The people were filled with wonder and amazement. What happened to this beggar? As recorded in verse 10. Like the people who were curious over what had happened, shouldn't we be excited over what God might do among us? especially in this second half of 2023. What will the Holy Spirit work, work among us so that we are able to say God did it? We read further in Acts chapter 3 how Peter responded to the people from verse 12 onwards. We know that Peter and John were quick to direct the, all the glory of the healing back to Jesus. the greatest mistake God's servants can make is to receive the glory and praise from man that is only due to Jesus Christ. Peter and John make it clear. They are just ordinary people. The healing was not done medically or magically. What happened was a miracle. Peter make it very clear in verse 16 that it's the name of Jesus. His name has power because he has power. He has authority. If you want forgiveness, use his name. You want deliverance, use his name. You want healing, use his name. If you want restoration, your relationship, use his name. There's no power in other names, only the name of Jesus. The name above every name. The name of the one who descended to the lowest earth. The name of the one who ascended to the highest heaven. And now, his name alone has complete authority. The name of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for the timely word for us. Fill us with the Holy Spirit so we can do mighty works in your name. For your glory and honor, in Jesus' name. Amen.